when you believe look let's end hunger and then you suddenly come up against the granite block that says sorry you can't end hunger because we can't give the food away to the poor they don't have money and you think what the hell that experience that when the curtain comes down that comes in struggle you know now if you come from a working class background reality does radicalize you a lot the possibility of reality but even simply coming from deprivation is not a radicalizing force uh, because you can also feel like look you know fate has cast us in a wrong way or if i try hard i can make it and so on it's struggle whether whatever your class background struggle is what radicalizes you the experience of it not your class position Welcome to the Recovery and Transformation Podcast, the show that links personal health with societal well-being. I'm your host, Samir Dosani. I'm an activist, a PhD student, and a health coach based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. This show explores the root causes of disease and talks about how people are recovering and transforming every day. Hi, and welcome to another episode. Before we begin today, a quick special announcement. It's my 46th birthday this week, and to celebrate, I'm giving away 46 health coaching sessions. To get yours, click the link below in the description. My guest today is journalist and historian Vijay Prashad. I first met Vijay about 10 years ago when he contacted me as part of research he was doing for a book on the anti-globalization movements in the 1990s. Now, I'm not a super important figure in those movements, but I was one of many student leaders. Uh, Vijay made the effort to reach out and find me, and we had a couple of conversations. When I lived in Delhi, Vijay would come by a couple of times a year, and we often found time to meet up and trade stories about movement building in different parts of the world. In this interview, we begin with some of his early childhood memories before going on to talk about colonialism, caste, and movement building. Now, if you enjoy these interviews, please do remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment wherever you're listening. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Vijay Prashad. Vijay Prashad, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's great to be with you, Samir. Always nice to see your face. So, Vijay, I, you know, I, I, um, I have good memories of you talking to people who I knew much better than you knew, uh, but you were able to somehow uh, figure out things about them that I never knew because you're a great journalist and a, and a good interviewer. So I, but I haven't seen uh, people interview you in that way. So I wonder if you could tell us, just to get us started, tell us a little bit about your childhood, your youth. Where did you grow up? Yeah, sure. You know, I was born in Calcutta in 1967, and I was born into the home of a, a very interesting couple. Uh, my parents, you know, were uh, well, you know, my father's family is from the northern part of Punjab, and um, they had come to Calcutta earlier in the 1930s uh, because my grandfather was involved with the then the Imperial Museum. Uh, he was a, on his side, he was a great translator of Persian, Turkic and uh, other texts. That was not his profession, that was his love. He was a great translator. My father grew up in that world, but my father was a very impatient man, you know, involved in the uh, events of the 1940s, turbulent events. Um, you know, he didn't study, he was impatient and wanted to build a new India and so on. My mother uh, you know, comes from a family uh, who was in the military. They were Sikhs, uh, also from Punjab, but also Burma. My grandmother, great grandmother, was a Burmese woman who my great grandfather met when he had gone there with the British Army, the Imperial Army. Um, they were interesting people. My parents, idiosyncratic. My father was involved in politics, in business, in a range of things. Um, you know, none, neither of them went finished school or college or anything, but they were very curious and smart people in their own right. I read a lot. Um, my father, for whatever reason, got into a great deal of trouble during the emergency. Um, I was sent off to boarding school at the time. Uh, didn't have the best experience there, but I took to sports a lot. Um, you know, I became, uh, I played games, cricket, I played boxing. I was very interested in in uh, in debating and and in 1982 I saw a photograph in probably Times of India uh, of uh, these two Palestinian women leaning over 
dead bodies. That was the Sabra and Shatila massacre. And that really changed my life, Samir, because from then onwards, I decided I want to explain to people what's happening in the world, which is in a way what I think of as journalism. It isn't just gotcha journalism, you know, like I'm going to get you and whatever. I, I really am keen on the practice of explaining. How does a 15 year old kid today, like myself, you know, in, 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 in 1982, how does a 15 year old kid sitting in South Africa know what's happening, you know, in Japan or in, in Chile or wherever, you know, and, and of course, all arrows pointing in all directions. And I was keen on that. And so I went into journalism, uh, worked for really terrible publications and so on. Um, you know, went to college uh, first in India, that didn't work out, found my way to the United States, uh, got involved in politics and journalism, kept writing. Um, and then I realized, Samir, that when I was back in India as a journalist, I realized I wanted to write about something that had bothered me a lot, which is, you'll know that in 1984, there was a terrible riot in, in, in particularly in Delhi, 3000 Sikhs were killed. Now, I'm not a communally minded person, you know, even though I come from partly a Sikh family and I, I started wearing my kara after 1984 because I felt somehow this fealty to Sikhs who had been massacred in, in that violence. But there were lots of rumors there that the violence was done by a certain Dalit community. And I didn't believe the rumors. I thought this is typical upper caste nonsense. So I was keen on that. And as a journalist, are you talking about the Balmiki community about the Balmiki community? Correct. And as a reporter, there was no space to actually figure any of that out. So I decided I wanted to do something and I wrote a dissertation about it. Um, I was really lucky. I spent, you know, four or five years traveling in Punjab, in Western Uttar Pradesh, now in Uttarakhand, in Haryana, um, in Delhi, in Rajasthan. I traveled all across North India meeting Balmiki leaders, elders, and I wrote, you know, a massive dissertation. I, I can't believe it. You know, I, I remember finishing the dissertation and my committee saying, there's too many facts here, you know, you, you, because this was the age of postmodernism. They were like, what's the theory? What's the this? And I was like, boss, I've accumulated a history of a people whose story has not been told. But like, you know, let's be frank, okay, the archive had not really covered their lives. And I had gone and looked at people's personal archives in plastic bags and whatever. It was an enormous project. Um, and I regret a lot of things about it. You know, I regret that I never tried to assemble the material into an archive somewhere. Uh, but then why would I take the records away from people? It was important to them in their lives, in their families, they transmitted plastic bag to plastic bag, suitcase of documents, suitcase of documents and so on. Anyway, the point is, I went into academics a little accidentally, you know, uh, I was really interested, as I said, in explaining. And I discovered, Samir, that it was not true that the Valmikis were involved, as it were, in killing the Sikhs. That was a rumor, a terrible, ghastly rumor. But what I also found was when I was doing my dissertation, Balmikis were being drawn into the Hindutva movement, uh, you know, to participate in the VHP, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad and so on. That was pretty chilling. And I've often had this thing in my head. Why do oppressed people align with upper, you know, powerful people against other oppressed people? That's like an obsession I have. And that came from the study of the Balmikis. Well, that's a big tour. I don't exactly know at what level of detail you needed it. I could have gone in any um, direction, but I oh, suppose I wanted stuff. to end up somewhere here. No, fantastic stuff. So uh, I think we'll get to this question about oppressed, uh, oppressing the oppressed people, oppressing other people. We'll get to that in a second. But at some point in your journey, I mean, I see a picture of Lenin behind you with, I believe, Chinese or Japanese writing as well. There must be a story behind that picture. <laughs> um, but but at what point do you sort of start, start self-identifying as a socialist, as a Marxist along this journey? Well, it's a complicated story. You know, people can tell you seamless things. You know, I, yes, I bought my first volume of Marx's Capital in 1981. And I have all three of those from 1981 there. You know, you open it and it has my name, 1981. In 1981, I was 14 years old. You know, was I reading Capital? Well, actually, the book I read then was a book I bought with those. And that was Tolstoy's Resurrection. Uh, and I don't know why I read it. Okay, I, I generally used to read James Hadley Chase books. 
uh, books that were in my parents' library. You know, Anthony Samson was a great favorite of mine. Nobody reads him anymore, but he wrote a book called The Arms Bazaar and he wrote all these books about international banking. And I found all that stuff fascinating. Anyway, the point is that the radicalism didn't come actually from reading. It came to me from reality. You know, my, my mother was a very sensitive woman and she used to take me often to, you know, various places to experience the harsh life of the poor in, in India. My parents were interesting, you know, like I tell you my birthday, listen, this is what used to happen to me on my birthdays. I'd get all these presents. My dad used to make three piles of the presents, sight unseen, couldn't open them. Pile number one, I could open immediately. Pile number two was put in a box for the rest of the year. Like if I did anything good, my father would open the box. Give me. Pile number three, sight unseen was given to the poor, you know, sight unseen. Um, and you know, my parents were not like people of the left or anything. My father believed India should follow the path of Japan, you know, uh, but there was a real sense of, of our rootedness in the world that I think sometimes gets forgotten that it doesn't matter what flag you fly. It matters how you behave in the world. And, and I really love my parents for that. You know, I, I miss my parents because I learned from them a kind of decency. You know, they were decent people. Um, and I miss them even now, you know, uh, my dad died in 1999. My mother died just a few years ago, uh, but I find that their presence is important. And I really know that parenting is really about transmitting that feeling to your children. Not, you don't want to make them some cookie cutter of you anyway, but the politics comes a little from that, but a lot from getting involved in struggles. And I got involved in a lot of struggles pretty early, you know, um, in Calcutta, I got involved in struggles, um, you know, expand, like youth struggles and things. In Delhi, I got involved in struggles. I got later involved in little trade union things, found I was not very good at it and so on. So really, you know, you go to the left, not through reading alone, but the experience of struggles, the possibility you can change the world, Samir. I mean, you know, it's one thing to tell somebody, read this book, it'll change your life. It may actually change your life. and, and it might and you know a number of books did change my life but going out there and experiencing the what fanon calls the granite block you know samir when when you believe look let's end hunger and then you suddenly come up against the granite block that says sorry you can't end hunger because we can't give the food away to the poor they don't have money you think what the hell that experience that when the curtain comes down that comes in struggle, you know, I can read any books which explain, you know, how the power elite functions and this and that until I'll tell you what totally radicalized me. One of my grand uncles was an RSS member and in the 1990s, early 90s, I went to his birthday party and a senior, senior RSS leader was there later to, he was a home minister of India. Um, he was not the home minister at the time, just a senior RSS leader, former student leader and so on. He took me aside at this dinner, this lunch party and he said to me, you know, Vijay, we read your material that you write. Um, and he said, you know, uh, you, it's okay if you're critical of us, the Hindu right, that's okay. You make fun of us, be careful. You make fun of us, be careful. When he said that to me, I, you know, you, that's the granite block. I'm trying to give you the, what does the granite block mean? It means they come and slap you in the face. This is a limit. And when you struggle as a young person, you experience the limits. That's, that's what radicalizes you. Now, if you come from a working class background, reality does radicalize you a lot, the possibility of reality. But even simply coming from deprivation is not a radicalizing force. Uh, because you can also feel like, look, you know, fate has cast us in a wrong way. Or if I try hard, I can make it and so on. It's struggle, whether whatever your class background, struggle is what radicalizes you, the experience of it, not your class position. Yeah, 100 percent. So, uh, Vijay, Bhai, there is a, a hypothesis that I am advancing in my own work and my academic work and in my other work as well, which is basically if I boil it down to its simplest, um, if I oversimplify it a little bit, it's it's basically that all of the problems that we have. So you've mentioned the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sivak Sangh, the Hindu right, but other things too. Here in South Africa, we have issues to do with corruption, issues to do with you know the legacy of apartheid, et cetera, et cetera, infrastructure issues, austerity issues, so many things. 
um, and in different countries around Africa or in different countries around Latin America, we have similar but you know unique uh, problems. My hypothesis is that all of these or most of these have, an, have a point of origin in the colonial period. Um, and I wonder if you'd like to discuss that hypothesis either with regards to the RSS, which we've already talked about, or any other examples that come to mind. I mean, the RSS to me is a clear one because you know I recently uh, did an interview with uh, the filmmaker Anand Patwardhan, and he pointed out that in the in the Babri Masjid um, case, uh, you know, it came out that the year that this whole thing started was 1857, and in the case, it's just said as if that that year is not important, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but it's really like it was the British trying to at that point. It was 1857 for for our listeners. I mean, it was it was not a it was a close thing. The British very nearly lost control of India. Um, and so one thing that they did was to try and create this division between Hindus and Muslims. And one way that they did that was by claiming that this uh, place, which was the Babri Mosque, underneath it was a temple that had once that had been the birthplace of Lord Ram, right? Yeah, I mean, look, firstly, it's not that they almost lost their holdings, the English East India Company, they did lose the cities. I mean, they were defeated by the uprising. It's just that then they made these alliances and they came back, including with the uh, kings of Punjab, you know, with various royal families, with the with the royal families of, of Nepal. Uh, you know, that's how the Gurkhas enter the British army. Uh, they become a key part of the, Gur- of the British army because they were sent by the king of Nepal to give, you know, the English East India Company a hand. Um, after the 1857 uprising, the British did go after the this view that the Muslims were a, a perfidious race of people. You know, W. W. Hunter wrote a very famous book about the Muslims, where they you begin to see this this just persistent discrimination against Muslims because the argument made by the British was it was the Muslims that rose up, and not the Hindus. Uh, it's actually not factually true. It's not a factual truth and it's not even true that so-called Muslims rose up because, you know, guess what? A lot of Muslim elites were with the East India Company. They were commercial elites and so on. It's not a communal or religious uprising. It was an uprising uh, of... And in fact, Bader Shah Zafar had to sort of been the arm twisted to sort of to be the, the figurehead of behind the movement when it was actually other people, Rani Lakshmi Bai and many other, mostly Hindu leaders who were actually doing most of the fighting. He was a poet, okay. He was just sitting in the the red fort in in Delhi, quite happy, you know. And then these fellows came, rode to the 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 red fort gates, and said, you know, come, become the Badshah of Hindustan again. And he was like, okay. And after he was overthrown, finally in 1858, he sent to Burma in exile, and he's perfectly content. He wrote poems there, you know. No, this was not his conspiracy. This comes from below, and. Um, but the British systematically put these things on the table. You asked me a broad question. I mean, Anand is quite right to talk about the case of the, the Babri Masjid, you know, uh, mosque built in the 16th century, you know, raised up suddenly in the mid 19th century by, you know, serendipity. No, not serendipity. Part of a project to basically create social dissension. You know, what we used to call divide and rule. Um, you know, at some point, people thought, oh, it's too crude to explain things by divide and rule. I don't know why. You go and read the British documents, they tell you directly, it's divide and rule. Um, you know, lux ex imperia, it's actually a Latin phrase. Uh, we didn't make it up. Historians didn't make it up. It's, you know, carved in stone in British buildings, you know, um, whatever it is, the, you know, divide and rule. I've forgotten the exact Latin. I might have bungled that but I'm not a Latin scholar. Um, The point is that, yes, um, a lot of our problems are inherited in the past. Now, we have to go in two directions in this, Samir. One is that you don't want to say everything is in the colonial period, okay? Because like, take India. We've got this wretched caste system, one of the most disgusting social systems in the world. The British didn't make this up, okay? Contrary to what a whole generation of historians wrote, you know, where they wrote about the social construction of caste and all that. Sorry, pals, caste was there long before it was a gross thing. And it was there, you know, from God knows when. Subira Jaiswal has a wonderful book where she traces 
much older histories of some of these deprivations and the attitudes and the practices. The British just basically jumped on the horse of caste and rode it, you know, to their advantage. And they through the census may have fixed it and whatever. But by the way, he didn't need the census to fix caste. Okay, uh, tell that to Dalits in many parts of India. You didn't need this. They were not waiting for the census to fix caste. It's pretty fixed beforehand in common practice, you know, quite brutally. So, you know, it's not like colonialism is responsible for everything. You know, we are also we have a hideousness in our own past. I'm willing to accept that. But there are certain things that the colonial experience did endow us with. Uh, one of them is it created a kind of a deepened social antagonism in a place like India between Hindus and Muslims. Um, if you look at South Africa, look at how the apartheid state divided people, you know, blacks, Indians, coloreds, whites. I mean, what the hell is this? Yeah, you know, I mean, what is this nonsense? Like, you know, uh, it was such uh, segregation. Uh, the apartheid system was such intense segregation that there were communities that literally didn't even interact with each other at all. You know, they, at the margins, maybe traders did, but they lived in their own planet. I don't think that's very healthy for any society. You know, one must have the interchange, free interchange of ideas, cultures, customs. It's more normal. You know, this is an abnormal thing. In India, the British did this. You know, they, they, they really deepened antagonisms. And the way they did it was they created capillaries of power to dominate the people by making alliances by the mo with the most conservative forces, conservative mullah type characters and conservative Hindu type, you know, uh, kings and so on. I mean, if you look at a map of British India, actually large parts of British India were under the suzerainty, you know, they were notionally controlled by uh, the Nawab of, of, of Hyderabad or the Pulkiya states of Punjab and so on. You know, these are conservative Muslim, Hindu and Sikh royalty. You know, uh, that's the people who are the principal allies of, of the British. And these are the people that end up funding the RSS. Where was the RSS created? Nagpur. Who were the biggest funders of the RSS, the Hindu Mahasabha? It was the bloody wretched kings, you know, and the high, you know, the, the pujaris of the high mutts. These were the fellows who first come in. Later, it's, it's the big industrialists, the Hindu industrialists that finance the Mahasabha. You know, the Bidlas and others will come in, put money on the table. It's the same thing with the Muslim organizations. You know, it's not, it's not your uh, Mapila peasant, you know, from the Malabar coast who's funding the Muslim League. Come on, forget it. It's your industrialists in Bombay and so on. They fund it. They finance it. It's your Khan Bahadurs and, you know, these fellas who got titles from the British who were there in yeah, the first. Huh? You're talking about my great grand. You're talking about my great grandfather, Khan, Khan Bahadur Dosani. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't exactly mean your great grandpa, but, you know, it's people like that 1906 founding of the Muslim League. Who's the roster? You know, it's not some landless bloody peasant who's there, man. It's some, you know, aristocratic uh, figures that are there. It's the same in the Mahasabha. So these are the allies and, and they create fissures. Brits were pretty mischievous, you know. But I want to say, at the same time, it's not just the Brits. It's the Indian elites as well. You know, they, they took advantage of this to hold on to power. I mean, the Maharaja of, or rather, sorry, the Nawab of Hyderabad, when he was overthrown Nizam, finally, Nizam. Yeah. Nizam of Hyderabad, sorry, was the richest man in the world, you know, with mm. the giant diamonds and God knows. As children, we used to always be told that he was the richest man in the world. Hardly a good thing. Hardly a good thing. You know, what does this mean? Um, and a ruthless, you know, Savak style, style police force in Hyderabad, uh, ruthless to the people. Um, it was the communists who first rise up against him and so on, you know, in the great uh, Telangana uprising, you know, eventually the mass movement against the, the Nizam and so on. But what I'm just trying to get at is, yes, Anand is right that the Brits put a lot of fissures, but I also don't want to, you know, take the blame away from a lot of the Indian elites who colluded with them. And that kind of collusion, boss, we see it today. Come on, you know, you take any of our countries, it's not just the imperialists who are you know, doing bad things, they have enough bloody, you know, subordinate allies in our own countries.
Yeah, no, for sure. I, I just wonder, so getting back to this question about, so let's take another example. Let's take the example of Gujarat in 2002, when you had low caste and even quote unquote tribal people um, in India that doesn't have the same connotation as it does in Africa, but what, you know, what we call Adivasis in, in Gujarat um, were, I don't know, co-opted, bribed. I, I still don't know the exact mechanisms by which they became sort of the cannon fodder for doing the RSS's dirty work in Ahmedabad and other parts of Gujarat, right? So you have you have elites, and there's no doubt that there's a lot of elite funding. There's no doubt that it's planned. I mean, this this is all in, been documented very well. But you you did have a, a class of people who one would expect, if there was, you know, in pure Marxist terms, they were acting against their sort of class interests, um, but were were turning against other. I don't want to call people oppressed because they, they were burning sort of the houses of rich Muslims. Like it's it's they're burning houses of people who were. A different ca- class than them. There maybe they were middle class or maybe even upper class, but a different community. So, I don't know. How do we how do we put these pieces together? I mean, there's a couple of things to say. First, you know, I don't know if you read the novel Tamas by Bhisham Sahni, but you know, the novel Tamas and the TV show that came on Doordarshan toward the end of real Doordarshan um, opens with a classical scene. You know, uh, you know the when communal riot is depicted, the so-called Hindu-Muslim riot, it begins with an incident. What's the incident? A pig is slaughtered and its carcass thrown into a mosque or a cow is slaughtered and its carcass thrown into a temple or a noisy bunch of, you know, reveling Muslims go past a temple or a noisy bunch of reveling Hindus go past a mosque at prayer time and so on. You know, these are like the cliches of how a clash takes place. Well, in the Tamas, it begins just like that. The question is, neither are Ashraf Muslims nor are, um, you know, upper caste uh, Hindus going to kill a cow or a pig. Okay, Uh, you're not going to see necessarily some Ashraf Muslims sitting there slaughtering the cow, you know, in order to do that or certainly not going to see some Brahmin sitting there and cutting the throat of the pig. Okay, they hire Dalits to do that. And that's how the novel begins. It's actually a beautiful beginning because it's people who are, you know, hired into the creation of the riot. You have that kind of thing, lots of evidence, but I'm not interested in that because that's minuscule and, you know, minor. Here's the real thing. We don't get the history we want, okay? Class antagonisms appear befuddled and twisted through race and through religion and through patriarchy and a whole bundle of, you know, Class antagonisms come in a way that you don't like because it's messy. If it was cleaner, so much easier to advance to the next stage of humanity, you know? No, it's messy. So what happens is you live in a society where, for instance, um, landlordism or merchantism is refracted through religious communities. So take the case of parts of Gujarat. You'll have, you know, these three classic uh, communities, traders, that convert to Islam first in South Asia, you know, Boras, Ismailis and so on. Um, These are traders. They were traders across uh, to Arabia and so on. They had not, they were not all Muslims forever, you know, but when Islam comes to the peninsula and these traders interact with the Muslims for either pragmatic reasons or for reasons of belief, they actually convert in large numbers. So the Ismaili community is a trader community of Gujarat with very old roots. Same with Bora, Daudi Boras and others. They convert. No, but these are traders before they are Muslims. You know, um, they're traders prior to being Muslims, but they're traders. So they get wealthy, they have a big house and so on. And there's resentment. And when there's an uprising, people attack them. Now they are not attacking them always only as traders. They attack them as Muslim traders. And that then takes on a character of, of, of terrible, you know, inter-religious conflict or landlordism in, in Malabar. I'd already mentioned in 100 years ago, 1921-22, there was an uprising in South Malabar, the so-called Mopla Rebellion. Well, the Jannis, the landlords were all upper caste Hindus. Um, the, uh, the tenant farmers were all Muslims. And when the tenant farmers rose up and went and slaughtered the landlords they slaughtered them also as hindus so it they were slaughtering them as landlords but also as hindus because the structure of land tenure was already communal so the violence against the agrarian structure also had to be communal it mirrored it you know it's like fanon's chapter in wretched of the earth fanon argues 
that it's not that people are violent. The system is violent. So when people rise up against the system, they only know violence and they act violently against a violent system. That's what Fanon, by the way, in that book doesn't say go out and burn the building down. He doesn't say that. He says people will burn the building down because the building is burning them. It's already violent, you know, in the same way in Gujarat in 2002. Yes, there were these kind I, I have in the readings I've done and in my PhD, which was a thousand years ago, I remember thinking that the structure is already communal. And when people rise up, of course, they can't rise up in another structure. They can only rise up in the structure that they're in and they end up, therefore, in a communal uprising. You know, now that doesn't mean all communal uprisings are some progressive thing. Most of them are wretched. So again, going back to the Moplar uprising 1922, 21, 22, um, you know, when the communists interpreted that uprising, when Abani Mukherjee writes an article, actually in 1921, he writes an article during the uprising. He says this is an agrarian crisis, but they caution from Abani Mukherjee to AK Gopalan and so on. They caution we should not as as organizers in the Kisan Sabha organizing farmers and so on, we must never use religion because we must prevent it from becoming a communal conflagration. A.K. Gopalan gives a speech in 1946 for which he's jailed for years. You know, he was in jail when partition took place. He was one of the great communist leaders. He won a seat to the first parliament in 1951 in the Lok Sabha elections of 51. He won a seat, but he was in jail during partition. Why was he in jail? He gave a speech in 1946, Samir, where he talked about the Mopla uprising and what he said, it was the 25th anniversary. What he said was, this is in the same tradition as as, as Bhagat Singh, he said, it's the same tradition as the Quit India movement of 1942. He said, we must prevent the Calcutta killings of 1945. You see, that's when there was in 46, a communal upsurge in Calcutta where Hindus and Muslims killed each other. So there's always a tendency to that because of the structure that's been created. We have to fight to canalize that in a different direction. You know, that's why our work mm -hmm. In secularism, it's not about saying, hey, listen, we're actually inherently all loving people. No, we're not. Our system is wretchedly violent and it pits people against each other. And our task as people who believe in secularism is to fight against the structure, you know, as much as anything, which produces a consciousness. You know, that's why our task is so much more difficult than the task of the right, which can just summon the devils from the structure, you know, which are actually more normal and therefore appear to be more human nature. Nothing human nature about it, but it is rooted in the structure and that's their advantage over us. This is fascinating. I mean, I just want to bring it to the, the present and maybe even the future in the sense that, you know, again, sticking to India for a moment, although I think, I think we'll, we'll take it beyond India in another moment, but sticking to India for a moment, you have this ancient caste system that you've described. You have this colonial system on top of that which still, I would argue, exists in many ways. Then you have some attempts at sort of Nehruvian socialism or wherever you want to talk, it, talk about it, some attempts to sort of at least undo elements of that with, you know, we can discuss to what extent that was successful. But now you have just in the last five or six years, you have a BJP coming in and with a completely different narrative, trying to reify a certain imagining of the caste system, even more strict than perhaps existed in history. Um, and, you know, and facing lots of pushback and facing lots of movements and so on, but, but still having the upper hand when it comes to violence, still having the upper hand in, in, in a lot of ways, EVMs and so on, maybe, you know, what the, uh, the possibilities of vote rigging still exist. So in the current structures as they exist in India, well, you know, strategically speaking, what can we do? And I know that if I'd asked you this question 20 years ago, you would have said, you know, organize, go out and join your unions, go out and join the parties, you know, get active and so on. And I mean, is that still the answer today or is there something I'm missing? Is there some way that we can challenge these structures um, given that all this power is against us at the moment? I mean, you have to do a million things. I mean, it's not that there's one way to go. You know, I mean, India is a country of 1.4 billion people, different things in different parts of the country, in large parts of southern India where the anti-Brahmin Dravidian movement was strong. 
um, you know, they have been able to start settling accounts with the caste question much more than in North India. So in, in places like Tamil Nadu and so on, you know, where the consensus is in the Dravidian movement, they'll have to renew the Dravidian movement. It's lost its way. But, you know, that's they are in a different place than Uttar Pradesh, you know, which reeks of caste hierarchy and wretchedness and so on. And I, I, I have no problem speaking like that. You know, uh, I've lived for enough time in, in what is now Uttarakhand. You know, please don't lecture me about being culturally relativist and all that stuff, because I don't like the culture of, of the caste system. You know, P people will tell you, oh, my God, you sound like a colonial whatever. Oh, my God. Or modernist, you know, I modernism. Mean, just, to, um, yeah, just to stick to UP for a second, because I, I get the feeling that just in the past 10, 15 years, it's become even worse. People sort of identify with their caste identity to even maybe it's, maybe they're just more open about it. Maybe it was always like that. Dude, it was, it, was never, it was never anything than what it is now. Okay. Uh, I remember in the 19, in 77, I went with my parents to campaign for Raj Narayan in Ra Rai Bareilly, you know, uh, he was a great socialist leader and we went in his convoy in these rural parts and, you know, Dalits were just not permitted to come to the, the rallies uh, and that was, a you know, Raj Narayan needed that vote, uh, you know, very much I mean, forget his politics, he may have had his own problems, but people were not permitted to come you know it was archaic I, I being born in calcutta which you know has its own history of caste hierarchies and so on um you know but i was shocked by what i was seeing in up and then when i was living later uh, up in Dehradun in the hills you know i experienced things i couldn't imagine like really seriously like you know okay i'm going to say something pretty naive but you know i grew up most of my life in a building in Calcutta where, you know, I remember once there was a man who used to come and he would clean the floors in our apartment. But in our apartment, my father was an interesting character. As I told you, this man would do all kinds of things before he would zip off for his cigarette and, and so on. I remember once my father sent him with a note saying, you know, tell the upstairs neighbor, just give the note. So the, this man, he's from Odisha, went and gave the note to the people upstairs. And then he went off for his, he used to love to cigarette and gamble and so he disappeared. Then maybe the next day, my father heard all the ding dong noise upstairs. You know, they are having a havan. So he inquires, what's the havan? He said, because this man came in, we have to purify a house. My father was like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, he was furious. He took him, this man upstairs and, and said, how dare you disrespect this man? You know, he, he, he cleans my house. He works in another house. That my dad was like that. But point I'm trying to make is Calcutta was bad enough. What I experienced in UP, I couldn't imagine how this graded hierarchy functioned in everyday life, Samit. That's, you think you're saying it's got worse. I'll tell you what's happened. It's not that it's got worse. What's happened is with the ass political assertion of the Dalit movements, of other so-called, um, you know, what are known as other backward caste, but really oppressed caste movements, with the political assertion, you know, through the BSP and also through the Samajwadi party and so on and other smaller parties, the section of the Brahmanical and the uh, Thakur elites and so on have become much harsher against them. The violence has increased. We saw that in Bihar in the 70s. It's when, uh, you know, Kapuri Thakur, who was then the, you know, uh, Chief Minister Bear, when, when, when the reins of a system are loosened, Alexander de Tocqueville writes about this, by the way, he's warning uh, aristocracies. When you start liberalizing the thing, then the revolution comes and that's when the hammer goes down. So you see in UP, there's a kind of assertion of elite power against movements, but also clever because the BJP is cleverer than people give it. You know, they have basically identified enemy number one is Muslims. That's enemy number one. And they want to do what the Hindu right has wanted to do for over a hundred years. It's a term called Sangathan. Um, Swami Shraddhanand in Punjab and in that region, Shraddhanand Saraswati was on this trip over a hundred years ago. What is Sangathan? Sangathan means bringing together. And the, the logic was let's bring together all the quote unquote Hindus against the Muslims. The Hindus are weakened by, by fragmentation. Bring the Dalits in, but bring them in and tell them their place. 
but bring them in nonetheless. This is a hundred year project. So you see that happening now. Right now, there are all these dharm sansads going on in anticipation of the election this year in UP. And at all these dharm sansads, the violent language against Muslims is to be heard, to be believed. You will not believe it unless you hear them on tape, the things they say. But they are not going after Dalits or anything there. You see, they want to discipline Dalits, but they want to yeah. attack Muslims. That's the distinction I would like to make. But to what extent, so, so this is something that we've gone into a bit on, on the, the Peace Vigil channel. To what extent is, it, you know, it, let, me, let, me, let me put it as a proposal. So I would say that, I would, I would suggest that the Hindu rights fear of Muslims in India is not to do with Islamophobia as we might see in other parts of the world, because these people are perfectly happy to work with the Saudis or whatever, the Kuwaitis or whoever they like, right? So what it is is, you know, because the Muslims are the ones who've been able to escape the caste system and the Christians, I would say, um, it, is, it is really a, a form of, um, it, it, it has its origins, uh, and Hindu anti-Muslim Islamophobia has its origins in the caste system. Would you agree with that? I mean, I'm not sure because in, in many parts of, of Northern India, Muslims are quite happy to have created the caste system. Okay. I mean, you know, we have, you know, Razil Muslims. What the hell is a Razil Muslim? Ashraf and Sharif and Razil. Yeah, and, yeah. You, know, you, you, you know, you go to the Sikh community from which my mother hails. There's the Mazhabi Sikhs, which are the Dalit Sikhs. How can you have a Dalit Sikh? You have only Sikhs. It's supposed to be egalitarian, you know. How can you have gradations in Islam? No, no. I, in many parts of India, Muslims are quite happy to have inherited the graded hierarchies and so on. But differently, it's the it's the nearness to the Prophet is the way it's done. You know, if you are a Sharif, then you are a descendant of the Prophet. And, and, and Sari and all these kind of things, yeah. All of it. You, you know what I'm yeah. talking I mean, it, it gets more and more detailed as you as you go into it in more proper way. Anyway, so I, I don't know if that's it. Uh, I'd like to say that the antagonism um, that was fed uh, by our history, um, you know, goes back in deep into the 19th century. And actually, you see it more in Bengal, strangely than anywhere else, perhaps in Bengal and in Punjab, where you see it in in the so-called Hindu revival movements of the 19th century. And, and in, now I'm going to start saying I, I said Bengal, then I said Punjab, then I'll say Maharashtra, you know, you keep adding. You go back to the Hindu revival movement, you know, where what happened was that a lot of these um, the, bank, the the elites, the Hindu elites of the time were not they were not unhappy with colonialism because they were also able to make money, you know, as traders and so on. They were not in deprivation, but they began to make an argument of history, a historical argument that mimicked the British colonial argument that was there in James Mill, which was that there was a glorious Hindu past. This, this is James Mill's history of British India. I think it's 1821. You can check the date, I think 1821, somewhere as early as that. Mill is the father of John Stuart Mill, you know, um, yeah. who is the great liberal thinker. Yeah. yeah, so James Mill worked in the India office and his multiple volume history of India divides India history into three parts. Ancient India is the golden age, glory. That's when the Aryans come from Europe and, you know, they, are, they bring Roman and Greek greatness. Now, Mill is influenced by, you know, Sir William Jones, uh, who discovers the link between Sanskrit and Latin and Greek, you know, the so-called Indo-Aryan languages. And so the ancient period is the golden age. The modern period, the British period, that's the return of civilization. The dark ages, now see the division. It's between the Greek civilization, the dark ages, and then the Renaissance. They map the same tripartite division into India and say the golden age of the Vedas and the Hindus and the this and the that, the modern age of the British bringing civilization, rationality, trains and all that, although no trains in 1821. And then the middle dark ages is the Muslim period. When the Muslims brought everything bad, they ruined the golden age. That was the narrative the British put out from 1821. Upper caste Hindus repeated this narrative. This is then Bankim Chandra Chattapadhyay, you know, and all these people. Like, you know, the Muslims came and ruined everything for glorious ancient India. Um, it's actually Indian liberals who then turn around like Humayun Kabir and say, no, no, you got the narrative wrong. 
the period so called middle period is the period of the creation of indian culture what they call the sufi bhakti kind of unity they call it the kind of ganga yamuna tehzeeb you know that sort of attitude is there that's in jawaharlal nehru's discovery of india they rejected the colonial hindutva narrative but that colonial hindutva narrative so it plays a role because then people say what's ruining our community the presence of muslims they are a blight it's got nothing to do with muslims are a challenge because they are egalitarian and we are graded hierarchy no it's that somehow existentially their presence is a threat they will you know bring the they, they don't believe in india they believe in they believe in a foreign place this is actually what links the attack on muslims to the attack on communists the muslims mecca is mecca the communist mecca is maybe at some point moscow and then beijing or whatever you know all foreigners to india the real indians are those who believe in in you know ram janmabhoomi and this and that and the other so i think that's the real thing it's this idea that the muslims are foreigners who ruined india and which is why there's such a big move in this whole sangathan you know when shraddhanand talks about sangathan part of sangathan is also to reclaim muslims back to hinduism to convert muslims back to their original religion quote and quote what they call what they call ghar wapsi and this kind of thing i suppose ghar wapsi but this is again a 100 year old uh, tradition you know um, where there was actually campaigns to convert muslims back and it's funny because muslims and christians would be criticized for being missionaries to converting people you know the the big conversions in 1982 and so on in tamil nadu but in fact the hindu rights project was partly to bring back uh, people to their natural religion and that's where this attitude comes samir that muslims in india 120 million at last count they are actually not muslims they are origin they are actually indians with this fraudulent religion that the attitude is the hindu right will tell see hindu right knows you can't kill 120 million muslims it's not possible you can't get 120 million people to leave the country it was hard enough for my family to come in partition 13 million people crossed the border hard enough 120 million are you nuts you know it's a, one of the largest countries in the world by itself so the idea is to make people subordinate their religion to their indianness and that means erase their religion that's the agenda samir it's much more that it's it's a kind of vicious feeling that you it's need to be indigenous hmm? yeah it's fascinating to hear you say that because i have a friend uh, i don't think you've met him his name is zahir john mohammed he's also like me from these uh, you mentioned the bora and ismaili communities that's those are my people so uh, he's from one of those communities as well and he happened to be in Gujarat in 2002 and then he went back in 2012 to sort of document it and, and write a book about it and as part of his work he interv- interviewed i think all of the muslim bjp mps and that is what they said <laughs> like almost to the letter that is what they all said that yes we are muslim but we are indian first i mean it's so a pernicious 100 year old ideology you know it's it's not new it's not creative um you yeah. know everything i hear when i watched a bunch of these youtube videos of the dharm sansad okay i mean okay i i mean i i read the these colonial documents of what the hindu revivalists were saying in their meetings 100 years ago 150 years ago even there was no youtube video there but watching the youtube video now i feel like i'm getting like a like it's like disneyland you know it's like i'm watching these guys they are like reenactors you know like people who dress up as like confederate uh, you know soldiers and yankee soldiers and they fight the us civil war in virginia or wherever you know these things happen these fellows at these dharm sansad meetings they strike me as re- historical reenactors they are reenacting the dharm sansads of 150 years ago it's a bloody cliche Yeah it's it's a, but when you put it that way it becomes quite depressing and so i want to ask you as we move towards the end of the discussion sort of uh, you know we've been you're a little bit older than me um but i've been at this game a long time and you've been at it even longer um you know there was there obviously one one is moved you know one tries to have what is the phrase uh, gramsci's phrase op- optimism of the will um but it's not always easy because we see right wing forces coming to power in the us in india elsewhere 
Um, and we think these are ghosts of the past. These are these are um, what's Gramsci's other phrase? The the uh, this now is the time of monsters. We think this is this this is something that should have been over by now, but uh, but here we are again. So what gives you hope in in that kind of a, a, a circumstance? Boss, we are talking in February of 2022. Okay, just within you know spitting distance of time, uh, Indian farmers for over one year sat in a dharna around Delhi, you know, uh, tens of thousands of farmers participated, if not hundreds of thousands. On 26 November of 2020, 20, 250 million workers went on strike in India. We're just talking India now. It's incredible. Look at South Africa where you're sitting, you know, there's all kinds of horrible things happening, but the workers still go out, you know, they are attacking, defending ESCOM, fighting on South Africa Airlines. This, that, and my dear pal and comrade Irving Jim, who just celebrated his birthday, is always out there, you know, fighting and yelling and singing and giving confidence to the workers who give each other confidence to continue struggling and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, let's not be too down on human history. Uh, you know, we have ancestors in these struggles, people who. 100, 200, 300 years ago were just 20, 30, 50, 100, 5,000 people, you know, got mowed down by uh, the Tommy gun of the British when they advanced and said, we stand for freedom. Uh, look, you're sitting in South Africa, generation upon generation of people first fought against the pre-apartheid regime, apartheid, you know, uh, look at the people, their, their struggles, their bravery. Uh, would Chris Hani have believed that they would win? And then would he believe that just the day after victory, he would get killed? You know, I mean, just to think about it, Samir, we can't even ask that question of what gives us hope. Because, you know, the fact that um, we're still alive and we're still resisting, you know, we continue to resist, we'll never stop resisting. That's another, that's a synonym for hope. You know, hope is too grand a word. Um, I would say, I, I asked Chomsky recently, you know, we had done a book together, it will come out later this year called The Withdrawal. So I asked him, you know, I was writing the opening section and I th was being cheeky and I said, you know, you're so courageous, Noam, what keeps you going? And he said, courageous? I'm not courageous. He said, you want courage? Ask the people who rose up in the Tet Offensive in 1968. He said, that's courage, you know. He said, that's courage. Our book opens with that conversation. That's courage, you know, and so when we ask hope, I mean, you know, what's hope, man? Hope is the feeling of being alive for you and me, for others. It's a silly question in a way. Don't you feel like you wake up every morning and you think, what do I do next? How do I move the needle? How do I advance things? You know, what song am I going to sing today that will lift the spirits of those around me? Full stop. 100%. I think that's a great note. You asked you ask me uh, how I feel about it. And I, I'm just telling you that this is now, I, I'm now old enough that I'm seen as kind of an elder in these spaces. So these are the kind of questions that I'm getting from young people who, um, you know, I, I'm also working on, on health and with psychological issues and so on. And I do find that people um, can lose hope in themselves, can lose that joy of life. And so I think it's important to remind everyone that that's why we're here. We're here because this is the dance, you know, we're not sure how it ends, but we, we got to dance it. Let's leave it at that. That's just beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, man. Vijay Prashad, it's been a real pleasure. It's great. Nice to see you. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Vijay Prashad. Do remember to click the link below to get your free coaching session and help me celebrate my birthday. You can also check out samirdosani.net for more content like that. With that, I'm Samir, your health coach and PhD student based in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'll see you next time.